Um, maybe we want to mute. Um, welcome, everyone. I uh, We're just going to wait a few minutes. I think we still have some people joining our webinar today. So uh, just hang tight and we'll get started in a few minutes. I see people are still joining. Okay, we'll give it another half a minute and then I'll, I'll get started. It looks like we still have a few more joining. So um, we'll just give it another minute here. Okay, well, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have a, a very full agenda. First, I'd really like to welcome you and thank you for coming to um, the webinar. Um, we put out um, a report earlier today. And so this webinar is an opportunity for um, the few of us from the task force to give you some background information about what went into the report and um, how we reached our conclusions in our recommendations and um, some of the limitations of the report, but it really will be an opportunity also for you to um, ask us questions. So I'm going to go through a briefing um, that should take about 30 minutes of the hour. And then uh, we'll be open for questions. Um, and I think um, the questions you, um, in, in the webinar format, I'm pretty sure you ask the questions in the chat, um, and then um, we will try to answer your questions. Um, and if there's another way of doing this, um, not in the chat, then when we get to that point, maybe um, Steve or Regina could let me know, or Donna. But um, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce who's here um, for this webinar. So I'm Nancy Potok and, um, oh, okay, I see um, the questions, the, if you have questions, they go in the Q&A, not in the chat. So if you all have the Q&A button, that's where your questions go. Anyways, I'm Nancy Potok. Um, I co-chaired the task force. 
Um, my co-chair was uh, Rob Santos, who had to resign partway through, but for a very good reason, because he was nominated to be the Census Bureau director. So he left the task force at that point. I'm joined by um, Tom Lewis and Denise Ross and John Thompson, who um, were uh, my colleagues. Hi, Rob. <laughs> who were my colleagues uh, on the task force. And um, then we have some uh, very able um, participation and assistance from uh, three people from the American Statistical Association, uh, Donna Lalonde, Steve Pearson, and uh, Regina Nesso. So um, I would like to really kind of launch right into the agenda because we do have a lot to cover. So um, let me get started. What, what I'm going to cover today is really sort of the context for the report. I'd like to go over our conclusions and recommendations, uh, the objectives of the report, the analytical approach that we took, our findings, the limitations of the findings, and then what we think the next steps should be. So um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I just would like to remind people that um, the task force issued our first report in October 2020. And that was a report that was um, prior to the election. And there was a lot of uncertainty around um, how the census um, was going to conclude at that point. Um, there were several lawsuits. There was not a specific end date yet in terms of when the field operations would end. Um, and there was a lot of question about whether census would be forced to produce a number by December 31st um, and whether that number would be actually two numbers, citizens and non-citizens. Um, and on top of that, there were all of the complications in the operations um, due to the pandemic and um, bad weather situations. And, um, prior complications from, from a lot of political interference. So um, we put out their report, not knowing really when a number for apportionment would come out, what they would look like. We had five recommendations. Um, three of them are here. Two of them I do wanna mention, I think they're quite important and should not get lost in the shuffle. And that is um, one recommendation was um, to do a review and a, and a deep dive into Title 13 and see if Title 13 needed revisions um, going into the future, particularly in preparation and thinking about the 2030 census, um, to make sure that the Census Bureau really had the independence that it should have, um, and to look at some of the Title 13 protections, et cetera, um, and whether those needed to be modernized a little bit or a lot. Um, the other one was really to that we felt that um, census needed to jump right into 2030 planning and the people thinking about that in the stakeholder community also needed to pay attention to that right away. Um, but there were three that are directly relevant to this particular report. Um, one was that the indicators for looking at quality should be readily available and used expeditiously to assess the quality of the census, and that qualified external researchers should be granted access to the data to help conduct the analyses, um, particularly in that um, very confused environment that we were in, and that additional assessments should be conducted when more data um, would become available. In other words, what we were suggesting initially wasn't the end of the road. There was quite a bit of work that was going to have to be done. So this particular report that we put out addresses these three recommendations. It doesn't address the other two recommendations. And it only really looks at the state population totals used for apportionment. That is the scope of the report. So um, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to jump right into the conclusions. So our first conclusion was that the indicators that have been released to date by the Bureau don't permit a thorough assessment of 2020 census data quality. Um, for example, you can't just look at the percent of completed enumerations in a state and um, know something about the quality. There's a, there's a lot more information behind that. In our October report, we have proposed a variety of possible indicators. Um, about census operations that could help 
evaluate the quality and the accuracy. Um, and we thought it could be done a lot more quickly than in previous censuses because of so much of that process information being collected electronically due to um, um, having the ability to respond online and because of the handhelds um, used by um, the enumerators in the whole operational control systems that were behind that. Um, but so far, only a limited set of indicators have been publicly released, and even the task force only had access to the state level indicators um, that compose the process statistics. Um, when I say process statistics, that means um, th that's not the characteristics of the people in the census. Those are statistics about how the operations were conducted. So let's go on to two. So um, despite all the concerns back in October when our report came out that the census numbers could be just jeopardized by political interference, um, the task force found no evidence of anything other than an independent and professional enumeration process by the Census Bureau. Now, I wanna be really clear about this because we are not saying there was no political interference in the census. There was quite a bit of political interference in the census around whether there should be a citizenship question um, with the Secretary of Commerce trying to set deadlines for various census operations uh, with you know, political people being planted within the Census Bureau in an unprecedented way. So we're not saying that did not happen. What we're saying is, when we went in and looked at the process that the Census Bureau was using um, prior to release of the data, um, and that was the delayed release. So the, the numbers, of course, after the election, the deadline moved back and, and the apportionment numbers did not come out till April. And that was very appropriate for the Census Bureau to delay release of those data products because that enabled them to do the careful review and processing that they needed to do to meet their own quality standards. And that's what we saw. So when I say no political interference, what I mean is that the career people at the Census Bureau who were in charge of the operations and um, who did the post data collection processing, and that was a very independent and professional job that they did. And that's what we wanted to say. So conclusion three um, was that across the limited set of state level process statistics that we evaluated, we didn't find major anomalies that would indicate that the census numbers are not fit for use for purposes of apportionment. Now, I, I'll talk about this a little bit more later what that actually means that we didn't find anomalies. So let's go to conclusion four. Um, our ability to more thoroughly evaluate the quality, accuracy, and coverage of the 2020 census really was hampered by limits on available information and research. And when I say hampered, I want to be clear, I don't mean that the Census Bureau was withholding data from us that we asked for. We got the data that we asked for, albeit quite a bit later than we would have liked to have gotten it, but we did get it. So, um, but when we started and when we were looking at this, where we said, well, let's start with the apportionment data that comes out first. Um, so we didn't have household characteristics in the data that we um, wanted to get, nor were they available at that point. And for several of the process statistics calculated, um, we also, we didn't find a lot of research that provided a clear enough understanding of the implications for erroneous or incomplete enumerations. So um, I will explain that a little bit more as we go through this as well, what, is, what that means. So let's go to conclusion five. Um, so the set of process statistics that we evaluated is relevant for evaluating the quality of the census numbers for apportionment. It is not in any way a statement about redistricting or distribution of federal funds and the fitness for that. Because for those, you really have to look at more detailed levels of geography and you have to look at characteristics and subgroups of the population. And now those were data that we didn't have. We just had state population counts and the process information around the state population counts. So what are our recommendations? Um, based on that, um, one, you know, we're very happy to see that the Census Bureau is 
has entered into contract with the um, National Academy and Committee on National Statistics to set up a panel to continue this work. We think it's really important um, to expand on the set of process statistics that we had access to. And um, we really want to see more detailed levels of geography at the census tract level and for population subgroups and have that be part of what the panel is looking at. Um, we did find what I would call pointers to areas that we think are really important for the panel um, to continue this work and, and look at and for outside researchers to be thinking about and looking at too. So that would include um, the, the increase in missing household characteristics. Um, so census has said that, that's public data, that there is an increase uh, in missing data in, in um, the responses that came back and, and that needs to be understood a lot better. Also, census put into place new procedures for counting the overseas population um, and particularly deployed military. And so understanding how well that worked, um, particularly as they were allocated back to states um, is something that really also needs to be looked at. Um, the late breaking changes and methods for using administrative records to enumerate non-responding households. So census, um, you know, throughout the decade had planned to use administrative records, but I think that changed. Um, the methods that they were using and, and some other aspects of that changed very late for the field operations. Um, and that has not been researched and evaluated in any way that we had access to anyways, um, to see how well that worked. Um, there were increases in the uses of imputation for group quarters. Um, that's, that's something that also really needs to be looked at. Um, that could be related to imputation for college students and dormitories, but it could be something else as well. And um, that really needs a deeper dive. And then a prompt determination of any increase in undercount of Blacks, Hispanics, and children relative to 2010 based on um, what we've seen so far in the demographic analysis. Um, we think that that bears some looking into. The Census Bureau hasn't really finished its work in terms of um, how some of these are gonna shake out. I mean, there's, there's well, I'll get into this a little bit later, but these are the areas that in particular, we would really like to see additional work done. So our second recommendation um, is that planning for the 2030 census should incorporate explicit attention to how data quality is going to be evaluated for 2030. And in particular, um, we would like to see the Census Bureau invest in um, ways that they can make these process statistics available um, much closer to um, the, the conclusion of the census um, as opposed to months and months later, because the data are there and they should be available. And um, that can be built into the process of how the census is planned. Because we think that the historical approach where you can wait a year or more to get coverage assessments just um, needs to be modernized. It's, it's not necessary to wait that long to start looking at some of these things. So we would like that built into the 2030 planning. Okay, so let's talk about the objectives. I think, um, you know, I mentioned we were looking at public and non-public data, uh, operational statistics to look at the quality of the state population totals for apportionment um, and to make recommendations for areas needing further analyses. So I think we did those two things. We used three sources um, to come up with our findings and our uh, conclusions and recommendations. So we used the process statistics from the operations. We did a review of the research supporting the use of administrative records and an examination of the demographic benchmarks. And we did ask a team of researchers to work with the Census Bureau um, to get the special sworn status and get access to the Title 13 protected data that um, would be relevant to our evaluation. So next slide, please. 
Um, I'm going to cover each one of these analytical approaches and tell you, give you a little bit of background about them. Um, so the, the analyzing of the 10 process statistics, the literature review and on research on admin records, and then examining the demographic analysis and the POP estimates um, as benchmarks. So let's move right into um, the 10 process statistics. So the, the process statistics that we looked at span the census operations um, of the master address file development, the self-response portion of the census, the non-response follow-up, the post data collection, data compilation and processing, and then the group quarters enumeration. So the next um, slide shows a table that's in the report that kind of takes the 10 process statistics and allocates them so you can see um, where they fell into the um, operations and a description of what they were. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you have about those. It's in the report. I don't think I need to go through all of them right now. So let's um, go to the next slide. Um, what we also put in the report was one data visualization of the process statistics. So as you can see, this kind of simulates a map of the U.S. in terms of where the states are placed, very roughly. Um, of course, Hawaii and Alaska, as always, are kind of off to the left there. Um, but what this does is it lines up the process statistics in a way where you can um, see them individually by state. And you can see by the legend that all 10 of them are in each little box for each state. Um, now, there are two tables that are in our report that have the data that was used to create this particular visualization. So if any of you are good with data, good with data visualizations uh, of an analytical bent, you can use the data in those tables and, and uh, kind of play around with them yourselves. This is also very useful data if you wanted to see something in particular in one state, like you were really interested in group quarters imputation in a particular state, um, or you, you were looking at the math revisions um, in a particular state or something like that. You've got that now, you can, you can see it. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit about these process statistics that we looked at. Four of them were only available for the 2020 census, and that was the revisions to the master address file, um, questionnaires that came in without IDs, um, enumeration with the administrative records, and then group quarters in the type of enumeration areas one and six, which is um, what one is known as mail out and mail back, and six was um, military with imputed counts. Um, now here's something, so this is a very important finding I'm about to get to, which is that we didn't find any research to assess to what degree um, these process statistics represent a potential for error um, because they represent changes in 2020 that actually were supposed to improve quality if they met their goals. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the first one, um, master address file revisions. So if you think about a state like Alaska, where it's very rural and where a lot of the operations were what the Census Bureau calls update enumerate. So where you can update the address list while you're out there enumerating because it's so rural and because it's very hard um, to tell sometimes with unusual housing and, and addressing uh, conventions, what's really out there. So if you looked at Alaska and you see, wow, they had a lot of revisions. Is that bad or is that good? Well, you know, you could see that as a very good thing. It means that maybe the enumerators really did a great job when they were out in the field of updating the address list. Um, in another location, maybe it's not so good you know, in a very urban area like New York City, that might be a cause for concern. Why were there so many changes in, in the um, address list in, in the middle of New York City? So it's not, it's not a just one way or the other type of thing. Um, same thing with questionnaires without IDs. So you might say, wow, doesn't that result, you know, that's a lot of duplicates. How do you know you've got the right people? But, um, you know, in the in the early planning of how do you get 
um, the best responses over the internet. One of the things that the Census Bureau planned for was that um, there could be a lot of situations where people are out, um, you know, at a NASCAR race, they're um, at a religious service, they're at a county fair, and you're saying, hey, did you respond to the census? And you want people to be able to just, you know, on their mobile phone or at a kiosk respond, but they, of course they don't have their password with them. So census planned for that um, and knew that there would be multiple responses from the same address um, potentially, but that would be a good thing. That could increase coverage, that could increase self-response. So the key here is how do you deduplicate that at the end? How do you make sure that you've only counted people once in that particular household if you've got multiple responses? So it could be good, it could be bad. If census did a bad, bad job on the back end, um, you could end up with a lot of duplicates. But if, if the processes as they planned it worked as they planned it, then that's actually a quality improvement. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. So there were six process statistics that compare 2020 and 2010 censuses. And these do represent situations where you could see errors, undercounts and overcounts. Um, but before you know what a specific risk is of error, you have to answer um, some very important questions because the 2020 census processes really did differ significantly from those used in 2010. So one of the things you have to comb through and determine is, well, are these differences uh, reflecting improvements in, in census taking methodology or do they actually represent errors of undercounts and overcounts? Um, and I, well, let's continue. So the experts went in and looked at the data, our researchers, and this is what they reported back to the task force. Uh, they said very clearly, the process statistics that we were looking at should not be interpreted as error rates. And I think I just went through a lot of reasons of why you wouldn't want to do that. And given the data at hand, they, their review did not find any conclusive evidence that state level counts used for apportionment purposes were lower quality in 2020 than in 2010. Um, and they didn't find any evidence that the apportionment count for any given state was an error. But, and this is a very big but, or a however, actually on the slide, is that, you know, the absence of evidence revealed by the process statistics is, it's insufficient to state conclusively that there were no errors in the apportionment counts. All it means is we didn't see anything, but maybe if you went on and you had the additional data at the lower levels of geography, um, and with housing characteristics, you might see additional information or if there was additional research that was more informative than what we had available, maybe evidence would, um, you know, be there. But we didn't see anything. The researchers didn't see anything. Um, so what they did was they recommended future research that should be conducted to better understand each of the process statistics. Let's go to the next slide. So the task force um, really conducted an extensive review of what we got from the researchers and, and talked to them, you know, to under, really understand what was going on. And we thought it was a very, very important first step in understanding the quality of the census. And we agreed with them that there wasn't any conclusive evidence um, that the state level counts used for apportionment were lower quality in 2010, and there wasn't any evidence that the apportionment count in any given state is an error. And we agreed that the development of the process statistics was important in understanding the results, but that further research really needed to take place to understand them better. So as a result of that, we felt like it was premature to use the individual process statistics as a direct measure of error risk or to combine them into a summary process statistic. Um, and that we didn't think there was really any scientific basis for taking these individual process statistics as a basis for ranking states against each other. Um, and I go back to the, my early example of the master address file in New York versus Alaska. So if you saw big changes in both of those states, 
you could say, well, both of those states were very high relative to other states on changes, but is that a good thing or a bad thing related to quality, you know, you, in error? Maybe one is less error and one is more error. So you can't really rank them. And, and because of the 10 process statistics really have, um, you know, positives and negatives, simply combining them and summarizing them doesn't really capture that nuance of, is it an improvement or is it a degradation of quality? Um, now, I will say that the, the researchers, you know, wanted to look at the numbers and one of the ways that they arrayed it was actually to kind of try to um, put the states in quartiles and rank them on this. So you can see that in their report, um, but I, I give you a very strong caution that it's not a direct measure of error or error risk. And in particular, um, they did combine it, but um, you know, it's not going to give you actually um, information. If you look at the combined statistic, it's not going to give you information that tells you anything about quality or error. It's just a summary of all the individual statistics that could be a positive or could be a negative. So you can see that um, visualized for you in some, you know, in, in that report, but the task force did not um, make that particular um, analysis and array part of our findings because we didn't really see evidence of um, how you could use that in a way that um, would, would be accurately informing um, the next steps for, for quality in the census. So let's go on to the next one. Um, I think I, I kind of did talk about the limitations of the analyses already in, in various ways. I do want to point out, though, that these process statistics are very valuable. Um, if you're, you know, a data user in a particular state, they are really good indicators of where you want to do a deeper dive, and particularly when um, data at lower levels of geography and, and characteristics of the population become available. Um, so they are very good um, pointers for additional research and things that you see that may not make a lot of sense when you look at them. Um, but they are kind of difficult to interpret on their own without this additional information. So um, we didn't draw conclusions about the quality of the 2020 census population totals for states from the statistics. Um, but we did look at some other things, and I want to talk about the other things that we looked at that led us to our conclusions. So next slide. Um, administrative records. So there were, um, we um, looked at Bob Fay, who was on the task force, did a deep dive with assistance from Tom and John on a literature review and looking at the research and trying to figure out what that was saying on administrative records. Um, so what we found was several considerations that were sufficient reason to withhold judgment on whether the administrative records enumeration were of equal quality to the non-response follow-up interviews that they replaced. Because um, you really need to post an enumeration survey and hopefully that's a good enough quality to be able to assess that. Next slide. Um, we did see that um, there were some research and arguments that supported the quality of administrative record enumerations. Um, so there was research that showed that the accuracy of the administrative record enumeration approach that of non-response follow-up at the upper end of a predicted agreement rate. Um, and after the 2016 test census, um, the Census Bureau did introduce several modifications to try to improve the use of administrative records. So the cumulative effect of all of these improvements over the decade really could have um, ended up in a, in a much higher quality of the administrative record enumerations. Um, but we don't know that. There's no evaluation right now. So it's possible, but there's no evidence of it. Um, on the other hand, too, though, the administrative records enumerations, and perhaps this was the most important function, they serve freed up resources of enumerators um, to, to do additional work in to complete the census operations that had to be completed under very short timeframes um, in the non-response follow-up 
um, housing units that could not be captured in the administrative record. So it did free up those resources and that could have been an improvement overall to quality by allowing the enumerators to focus on those other areas. Next slide, please. So, but on the, on the negative side of the ledger, we had some concerns too. Um, and that was that the, the um, early research that we saw were not very favorable um, in the comparisons of an administrative records enumeration as a substitute for non-response follow-up. And although we did see some other research over the course of the decades, it became less quantitative um, in terms of how informative it was on the quality of the administrative records enumerations. Um, we also saw that the 2010 um, non-response follow-up data was used as the training data for the 2020 application. And we were concerned that maybe using 2010 data um, wasn't the best data to use because of the changes that could have occurred between 2010 and 2020. So the algorithm and the predictions might be suboptimal because they're based on 2010, not on the current world. Um, we also thought that there's opportunities for the Bureau to clarify some technical details of how they implemented this, um, particularly at the end, such as the numerical values of the quality thresholds, um, which is like, where was there a high probability of co correct enumeration? Um, we think those thresholds changed. We haven't really seen any information about what that means. Um, and we only saw one study um, at best that, that examined the impact of the administrative records enumeration on historically undercounted groups. Um, and that's an important omission. So um, the jury is still out on administrative records, I guess. On the demographic benchmarks, um, we look, there's a table that is in um, the report that looks at this range of net undercount rates comparing them between 2020 and 2010. Um, and what we found if, you know, the plausible range is sort of the low middle and the high middle there. So it's plausible that 2010 and 2020 both had overcount. But if you go to the high middle area, it's also equally plausible that 2020 had a larger undercount, noticeably larger undercount than 2010 did. Um, so that really needs looking into. And then if you go and you look at the population estimates that are on the next page. Um, so the error of closure is what's used to sort of um, benchmark the censuses against the population estimates. And you could compare the 2020 census with 2010, 2000, and 1990. 2020 um, census came in a little higher than the POP estimates but it was actually well within sort of the range that has been there for current censuses. There was one outlier, but that was actually the 2000 census. Um, and the explanation for that is in the report. Howard Hogan, who was the chief demographer at the Census Bureau um, and is very knowledgeable about these, um, worked closely looking at these um, data. He was on the task force and he wrote a report. The report is available as part of all the documentation. So Bob Fay's paper on administrative records, Howard Hogan's paper on um, the demographic benchmarks um, in the report of the experts who worked with the um, process statistics are all available as um, input to our report. Um, so last slide, I think. Next steps. So this is our final report. We originally intended to do a second report. We thought this would be a quick report um, when the apportionment numbers came out, which could have been as soon as December 31st, but of course got delayed to April. We, didn't, we never actually got our data um, until the apportionment numbers came out. We started getting data. So it was very late in the process. And in the meantime, census has entered into this agreement with um, the National Academy of Sciences. So we think rather than having two parallel efforts running, um, we're kind of passing the baton to the National Academy to, to pick this up. Um, and we urge that the Census Bureau um, does make more data available at these lower levels of geography to help evaluate the quality of the census, both 2020, um, but also thinking about what's going to be available for 2030. And we hope that 
um, our recommendations get followed up on, not only in this report, but also the ones going back to last October, particularly um, a re-examination of Title 13 and the planning for the 2030 census, um, which needs to start now. We don't want that to get lost in the shuffle just because the immediate crisis from last October has passed. So with that, I think we will um, go right to questions. Um, now, let's see, we've got some things in the chat. Let me see what's in the Q&A. We have no questions yet. Okay, no questions yet, but you know, we're here. <laughs> You've got 30 minutes of, of our time to ask hopefully relevant questions. <laughs> Don't be shy, there's still no questions. Well, uh, while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, I'll just say Tom or John or Denise, um, is there something that you um, would like to add? I know Denise, it might be helpful for people to hear a little bit about um, how you've been using some of the indicators just yourself, um, you know, I that have. might suggest how they could be used. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So. Um... As we, you know, we look at the results of the 2020, occasionally you come upon something that makes you go, huh, I wonder what's going on there. And you go to a bunch of different sources. The Bureau has released their um, you know, four rounds of, of operational metrics now. So that's one source of clues. Um, I've been using just myself, um, the, the draft of this report, I've been looking at those 10, um, 10, 10 metrics to see what's happening in a given state. So for example, if there's something I'm not understanding about a group quarter in, in a specific state, I can look at that group quarter percent imputation rate and see if that, if that state had a lot of group quarter imputations. And it doesn't answer any questions, but it's just a, a, another clue as we try to, to figure out uh, what the numbers mean. Thanks. So we do have some questions that came into the Q&A. Um, the first question was, can we explain the difference between the assessment that the apportionment counts are fit for use and that an overcount is plausible? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I don't know, John or Tom, maybe you want to take that question. I'm going to let John go first. Okay. <laughs> Then why don't you go first, Tom? I, I'd like I thought I've been going first a lot. I, okay. Unless you don't want to. No, I don't mind. I think do you ever really know until the PES is out, or maybe even after that, whether things are fit for use? Probably not. But I all we can say, and it's really all we have said, is that we've seen nothing in what we've looked at that would claim they are not fit for use. Yes, there are the demographic and population estimates that show there could be an overcount and could be an undercount. I think the fact until further notice, innocent until proven guilty is my approach at the moment. Yeah, so I, I, I think what's, what's really, really important to understand this is that um, there's, there's a lot of good analysis that can be done with uh, more granular data, like looking at these process statistics at census tract levels for groups and census tracts. Uh, by geographic areas like cities, non-cities, rural areas, comparing them to see if there's a consistent pattern at that level between comparisons between uh, the 2020 census and the 2020, 2010 census to really understand if there's something systematic going on. And is that concentrated in particular states or not in particular cities? But until you can get into the track level data, um, or, or more granular data, it, you can't do much else, than, much more than what we've done. Um, so we have a, another question. It actually came in in the chat, um, but it's what's the plan and the timing for, for the PES so the Bureau can answer uh, the questions about administrative records? I mean, I think the Census Bureau knows what, what that timing is, but uh, I think all of us are under the impression that we're not going to see any results of the PES until sometime in 2022. Um, so it's going to be a while. 
I guess is the short answer. Nothing this year, as far as I know, but if somebody from census knows differently who's on the webinar, you can type it into the chat. Um, so another question is, good afternoon. Do you expect um, pushback on providing track level data? Um, because um, this, this uh, the question is, is it being withheld for privacy reasons? So um, I think, you know, that's a, it's a very, it's actually a, a deeper question than what it appears to be on the surface. So tracked level data, you know, that's in the public files. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's one thing. Um, what we really actually wanted wasn't necessarily um, widely public. We wanted access for researchers to the track level data. But that does bring up another question, which is, do the process statistics themselves really have to be protected by Title 13? Um, you know, does it does it violate someone's privacy or, or um, you know, put that them at risk to be re-identified if you can see um, how many imputations there were in a census tract. Um, you know, we we don't think so as a, as a task force, but um, you know that's a that's one of the things that I think why we are recommending. Let's take another look at Title Thirteen and see if it actually makes sense in this day and age. I mean, it's a it hasn't been amended in a very long time, and and these questions about what should be Title Thirteen protected um, and what shouldn't be, and what needs you know disclosure avoidance and what doesn't are really key questions in terms of what data can be out there at what levels of geography for these types of analyses. So, um, you know, Title 13 is, is really important for a lot of reasons, but it shouldn't just be a brick wall that, you know, the Census Bureau hides behind um, in order not to release these data or, you know, because the lawyers tell them not to do it. And I'll, I'll just add that the National Academy panel, unless Brian Harris Coteen tells me this is wrong, we will be looking at substate data track level even below, and the issue will come up about what can we include in our report at what level of aggregation and with what level of disclosure protection. Those are issues that are in progress, I guess you'd say. So um, we have another question that um, the set of process statistics um, that were used weren't sufficient to make conclusions about the quality of the 2020 census. So do we have any speculation on whether any of the other indicators or process statistics that we haven't accessed yet have been more informative about census quality? Like, oh, if we had only looked at these other things that we didn't look at, um, we'd have a much better idea of quality. You know, and I would say more than different um, process statistics, I think the level of geography and the population characteristics were what was really missing for, for us, but we were just looking at the state pop totals. So I think it, it wasn't so much we didn't have enough indicators, it was that we didn't have enough information about the indicators we were using. Um, but I don't know, um, Denise, Tom, John, um, you have any other thoughts about that? I, I mean, I, I the only thing I can say is that variation okay. at, at lower levels in these and others indicator and other metrics will help see whether even if we don't have a tight correlation with the value of a, of a measure and, and error, the big variations across demographic groups or even geography will show that there is something going on. Again, it won't necessarily say that the quality is poor or good, but it will say it really needs to be looked into probably using the outcome data as well as the, as the process data. Yeah, and I, yeah. I'm particularly interested for the smaller area geographies, how we can improve for 2030. So the master address file revisions, um, you know, what, what, um, what can we do to help build state and local capacity to produce high quality addresses well in advance of the count next time? And, um, and then with the, 
non-ID responses and the multiple responses, um, what kind of feedback might, um, you know, as they get out the count groups, look at that data. If they had access to the census track level data, then they would have uh, much better insights into how their outreach activities manifested in, in the final count. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, and the Census Bureau, to their credit, has put out a lot more data um, at the state level. And again, that's hard to really pin down or are there significant differences between states and things like that. So in answer to the question, I don't think there is any state level data that we say, oh my God, if we just had that, it would have helped, except maybe estimates from the PES that were... <laughs> that were modeled it to produce state estimates that they had enough variance, but um, enough uh, if the sampling errors were small enough. Okay, so um, we have another question. Without sub-state information, was there any effort to look at nationally by urban, rural, or by type of enumeration area? Um, I mean, the short answer is no, but I, I'm not sure how we would have done that without the substate data, because how would you sort of subdivide a state into urban rural if you only had a state population count? So no, we, we couldn't. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting analysis to be able to do, but without substate data, it's, it would, it's difficult to do that. Um, and then uh, another question was, did, did the report address data quality of um, online responses? Um, I don't think we, we broke that out separately at this point. I think I would just say that we didn't. And it's an example of something where the Bureau, or at least an entity, whatever it might be, will have to study the linkage between the online responses and, and some measure of quality and the hard copy responses and a measure of quality or comparisons of those responses for what are thought to be similar demographics. It's a work in progress. I suspect the Bureau is doing some of that and hopefully a cast of thousands eventually can do a lot of it. All right, so here's, here's a memory test question. Can you quote the exact section? This is like a Jeopardy question. What is the exact section of Title 13 that we're referring to? <laughs> That's yours, Nancy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, so rather, I, I could not tell you the exact section by heart, um, but I think there are a couple areas of Title 13 that we were especially interested in, um, first of all, you'd narrow it down to a couple of places. And one is the authorities of the Census Bureau director and how the census is conducted and the role of the Secretary of Commerce uh, in determining questions on the census questionnaire and things like that. That's something that really um, could bear some re-examination in terms of how that process works. Um, the other parts of Title 13 are really um, the privacy protections and the interpretations of what needs to be covered. You know, I mean, I think we have the broadest interpretation now, like anything that basically enters the Census Bureau becomes Title 13 almost if it's, you know, collected in a certain way, regardless of whether it's para data or operational data and it has nothing to do with individuals. Um, so, that's, that's something I think that, that needs uh, parsing out. Um, so another question is, um, when you're talking about lack of um, population, whoops, these are moving around as I'm looking at them. <laughs> when you're talking about lack of population characteristic data for our evaluation, were we talking about the characteristics that are now available as part of the PL release, or was it cross tabulations with the operation metrics? Tom, you've got your mute off. Okay, well, we, I mean, again, we keep repeating this, that we didn't look at population characteristics, but from my point of view, and I'm not speaking for the panel, 
what, what will be informative is both looking at the metrics as they are associated with population characteristics, demographic characteristics, and of course the actual recorded outcomes in the sense of what was on the form or on the web. So I think it's the whole ensemble that will help understand both the association of these metrics with quality, but also the variation in that within interesting domains. Yeah, I, I think we, we discussed this quite a bit because we did think about, you know, in our first report, what are the, what types of information would you want, even though in our first report, that was kind of the first cut was the state population totals without any characteristics. But going back to our first report, you know, I think it is important to look at how operations proceeded um, kind of superimposed over characteristics of those geographic areas, the demographic characteristics of the people in those areas, you know, whether it's urban and rural, whether it's, um, you know, a, a kind of a hard to count population. Um, and so if you start to look at things like imputations or, um, you know, other parts of, of it, then it makes sense when you've got those, those kinds of characteristics to give it context. I don't think, you know, that's, that's um, a big piece of what we were missing was some of that context for, for the process statistics. Um, okay, so another question. Um, this is from someone who does rural research and they're seeing county level housing unit number losses that raise many questions. So can we talk about total housing unit numbers and things that might have changed since 2010 that would explain losses that were unexpected um, that were even in counties that experienced great housing unit gains in 2010 and 2020? Um, so Nancy, let me jump in. I don't, we, I don't, think that there's any obvious answer, but it really illustrates the importance of digging in on some of the more granular level data and seeing if there are certain patterns of different of the process indicators, say, for, um, for rural areas, um, and really understanding not just one statistic, but a lot and, and looking at them. But And there, there's obviously a lot of good work that can be done, but um, but there's no obvious answer until you really get into it with, with a lot more analysis. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that actually is an interesting question perhaps for the, um, for the CNSTAT panel to, to look at as so, sort of what are, what are these unusual things that are showing up? Well, is there an explanation for them? Um, okay, so I don't see more questions in the Q&A. Let me just check the chat. Um, so there's, I don't see questions, I see comments. Okay, and we've got about four minutes left. So maybe, um, if, you know, if there's one more question, um, otherwise, is there um, anything that you know, anyone wants to say to sum up Tom or John or Denise? I'll just say, I wanna make sure everyone understands that our not having all these things we've listed as not having, we didn't want, well, we might have wanted them, but we didn't ask for them. We were doing the state level with the idea early on that we would then go on in, re, in the next report and do the Substate demographics and so on. The CNSTAT panel is taking over, if you'd like. But the fact that we didn't do that analysis is is it should not be taken as anybody's fault. It was really our focus. Yeah, and I guess I would add to that. You know, part of I I also don't want to leave the impression that um, the Census Bureau wasn't cooperative, and um, that's why it took so long for us to get the data. I mean, you have to understand that they already were missing statutory deadlines in there. It's a very limited number of people who actually could work with the data and understand it. And the way that the data are collected, and this is probably something that also needs to be looked at for 2030, um, 
they're really difficult to understand. You can't just like throw them together and really figure out what's going on. You have to sit down with the people at the Census Bureau who can explain the data and, um, you know, even put the tables together that you're looking for because it's not, um, it's not intuitive and it's not well documented. And so those people were not always available because census was under incredible pressure to get the numbers out first. And I think that was their priority rather than doing these analyses. Um, you know, and you can't really quibble with that. I mean, they did have um, a lot of pressure and a lot of people waiting for the numbers and a very limited number of people. But that doesn't mean that we should just accept that as kind of a great status quo um, and not think about how to improve that for 2030. Well, I, I have one other concluding thought and that is um, the Census Bureau career staff certainly need to be um, commended for conducting the 2020 census. I think they faced the um, probably in, in my opinion, the most difficult circumstances that any group taking a census has faced um, possibly in history of our country. I mean, they had weather events, they had a, a major pandemic, and they also had unprecedented political interference trying to hamper what they were doing. And, um, and, they, and they did the best they could to meet the deadlines. And then when it became apparent that they couldn't produce a quality product, they stood up to the, uh, to the politicals and said, nope, we're not gonna do it. We have to apply our quality standards. So I think they deserve some real kudos for, um, for carrying out the 2020 census. Yeah, I think the task force um, had a very strong consensus on that. <laughs> And also, you know, the, the Census Bureau was not obligated to share the data with us. Um, they agreed to do it voluntarily. They could have just said no, and they didn't. They opened the door. So um, we were very appreciative of that. All right. So we're, we're coming up on the uh, top of the hour. Uh, if if there isn't anything else, I think that concludes our webinar. I encourage you to actually read the report and read the supporting documentation um, for the report. It, it really is informative, um, even, um, but take to heart the limitations that we've put out there and uh, the cautions with using the data. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. All. Thanks all.